I'll let you take it away from there. Thank you, Kelly. This is Charlie Cahill. Um, welcome to everybody on the call. Thank you for joining us. Really appreciate it taking an hour out of your afternoon or for you on the West Coast, uh, the end of your morning. Um, you know, Michael and I were real pleased. Actually, Michael, why don't you pipe in with your voice so people can tell the difference between the two voices here. Hello, everyone. There's Michael. Um, you know, we were really pleased to be asked to uh, present uh, to the group at this time. There's, <laughs> all of us in the DB world know there's a lot going on, and we thought this would be a good time to talk about um, things plan sponsors should be thinking about for 2016 in order to um, take advantage of some opportunities, uh, lower the cost of their plan going forward, hopefully improve the funding of their plan, and reduce the risk going forward. You know, over the last, uh, you know, my career has been 30 years. I've watched interest rates decline for those 30 years. Uh, you know, corporate bond rates steadily decline. Um, we're at all time, we've hit all time lows in recent uh, uh, year or so on uh, treasury rates. Uh, the equity markets have been uh, all over the place during my career, and we were at the, uh, near the top of a, of a nice five-year run. Um, new mortality uh, studies have shown that uh, Americans are living longer and longer, with the exception, I don't know if people saw it today in today's paper, with the exception of uh, white males from 45 to 54, and that's just puts me right in my age category, so that was sort of depressing. But, uh, but in general, Americans are living longer. Um, and uh, the, the government continues to um, add regulations and costs to the plan. And so that confluence, the combination of factors, uh, makes this a particularly interesting point in the history of defined benefit plans. Uh, understanding the risks and opportunities that exist now uh, is important in order to sort of mitigate your risk going forward and control your costs. All right, so that's that's Charlie Michael. I'm the old guy with the hair. Michael's the younger guy with with uh, a, a better looking head than I have. Um, as you can see, we've both been around for a while, um, and uh, we like to stay active in the profession, uh, keep our sharp, and keep going. So move forward. I'm going to spend uh, the next 10 or 15 minutes talking about, you know, where we are uh, in for the various factors I just talked about and how we got there. And, you know, with the thought that looking sort of backwards and looking at where we are helps plan sponsors understand um, the risk that exists and how we may move forward with the value of, of our plans and improve the value of our plans. Uh, Michael's going to spend some uh, time doing a high-level overview of uh, strategies that plan sponsors can employ or deploy uh, to control the risks inherent in the investment portfolios of their plans. Um, each one of these topics could uh, take up a, a lengthy webinar. Uh, we'll spend a little time talking about um, how LDI controls interest rate risks and how structured equities can allow you to chase um, higher returns um, while avoiding, um, you know, catastrophic downturns that are possible with equities. I think we've got someone who's not on mute. To help with the triage. Charlie, I'm going to go ahead and mute everyone. Just hold on one moment. Super. Thank you, Kelly. Great. I'm going to spend a little time looking at um, liability risk transfer strategies, uh, lump sum cash outs. Um, hopefully some, if not most, of the participants have done one lump sum cash out. We'll talk about why 2016 is a great time to do one if you haven't done one and to do one more before uh, while the window doesn't close before they get more expensive in 2017. And we'll talk about annuity purchases and some strategies that you may want to deploy, even if you're not ready to terminate your plan or, um, or buy annuities for the vast majority of your liabilities, but why you may want to be looking at annuity purchases regardless uh, in, in 2016. Uh, we'll look at a couple of case studies and hopefully have some time at the end for questions. All right. So, Two charts on this page. The top one, it 
track Citigroup, the Citigroup pension discount curve, discount rate, and there's a single rate that comes out of a curve of rates. We'll look at curve of rates later. Um, a single rate that gets published every month. By the way, it uh, just got published today. It's down one and a half basis points for anybody who's wondering what happened in October. Um, and this tracks sort of the, the, the rate, the single rate for the last 20 years. We can see that 20 years ago we started at eight and a half percent. We are down now around four. Um, we've been as low as three and a half percent. You know why this is important is for every one percent change in the discount rate, you can ballpark a 15 percent increase in the plan's liability. So if we were still in an eight and a half percent world, we probably wouldn't be on this call, right? We, we'd be uh, quite healthy. Our liabilities would be half, hopefully our assets would be the same, and there wouldn't be a lot to talk about. But the, the reality over the last 20 years has been a relatively um, steady decline. I can draw a pretty straight line through this, but with some volatility along the way. The volatility is improvement because what we can see, though, while over this 20 years we've been, de we've been declining and, and gotten to the point where we are, there have been spikes and there have been periods where rates have jumped back up. And it's important for plan sponsors to monitor interest rates so that they can take advantage of those plan spikes when they come, o come along. A good technique for uh, looking when to do an annuity purchase rate, right? Rates are up a point. 75 basis point over where they've been in the year, it may be a good time to sell some of those liabilities. In 2015, um, that line looks a little smoother than the line above, but it really isn't. It's just spread out, right? We started the year at a little bit of below 4%. We dropped down to about 35 uh, right out of the gate. Looked like it might be a tough year. And quite quickly, we re rebounded, and we were back up to 4.5%. It looked like we were going to have a good year from a discount rate standpoint. The higher the discount rate, the lower the liabilities. Um, we've given some room back in the last couple months, um, and it looks like we may end up a little better, but pretty close to where we began the year. All right, to some extent, you know, that 20-year decline in, on corporate bond rates that we looked at sort of begs the question on what is normal. Uh, there's a general feeling that rates need to, will go back up eventually, but the question is when and how much. Um, what this chart is kind of a cool chart if you look at it. It's amazing that the state that exists. It starts in 1871 and it tracks 10-year government bond rates from 1871 to today. And when you look at it over a very long period of time, that mountain in the middle from 1967 to about 1999 is actually the outlier period. If you, if you sort of draw a line um, between 5% and 3%, you'll see that most of the time, 10-year government bond rates have been between 3 and 5%. Right now we're at 2, so it really does suggest that we have to go back up from here eventually. But are we going to go back up to the 6% uh, rates that we saw in the, you know, uh, at the beginning of the century, um, which would suggest maybe an 8 or 8.5% 8 .5 corporate bond rate? That is unlikely. That would be historically above normal. It's only during that period. Of course, for those of us, it's really sort of interesting to look at this because most of us, particularly people my age or maybe a bit older, we have lived. Um, I started working in 1983, not quite at the top of that trough, of that mountain, but near the top of the mountain. So all, my personal experience has simply been a downward decline in interest rates, waiting for the for the uh, rebound to come. Uh, I think at this point in my career, finally, a rebound will come. But the but how much and when is really the big question. So we've looked at interest rates, a little bit on equity markets. I sort of gave this away a little bit earlier. The top chart just shows what's happened to uh, the S&P 500 over the last five years, and it's been a pretty steady climb, right? You know, a little bumps up and down along the way, but the trend is, is darn clear. This year's been a little bit tougher, right? So uh, we had a, a decent start, and we had some highs that we hit along the way, and then we sort of get kicked in the teeth in August um, due to some foreign pressures. Um, but we've uh, recovered over the last few months. And in fact, you know, as, as always happens when you put a presentation together, you put it together two weeks ago, and what happens, there's been an equity run up since. And as of yesterday's close, I'm trying to market today, um, we closed at 21.04. So I'm almost back up. We're only up about 3 or 4% for the year. But it, you know, if you're going back to the top chart, looking at the five-year trend, it sort of begs the question of how much more there is to go. 
Um, we do know, you know, what goes up must come down. And while over the long run, we do expect, we would expect equities to continue to go up, we know that we have run-ups, big run-ups, and then there are corrections. And it does feel like the correction may be coming. Not an investment advisor. I'm just a lowly actuary. But the trend says, does speak to itself. Okay. But I am an actuary. And we're actu we actuaries, we love talking about death. We love mortality. Um, so this is a very exciting chart to an actuary, um, but an important chart for plan sponsors of defined benefit plans, and actually anybody looking at retirement plans to understand. So let me spend a little time um, explaining what's going on. So on the left, we have life expectancy, so going from 0 to 100. And on the, the bottom, we have sort of what, what the life expectancy was in 1900 and then all the way up to 2000. And the underlying data here is broad Social Security general population data. And what the dark color is, is graphing or, or uh, illustrating was life expectancy at birth. So at birth in 1900, look at my notes, um, folks were expected uh, at, to live 48 years after they were born. And the, the reason that it was relatively low, the low 48, was that, you know, it was pretty tough to survive childhood. It was really tough to survive infancy. And even surviving being 5, 10, 15 years old, uh, mortality was pretty high. There was a lot of disease um, associated with those ages and, and just, just general danger. However, if you made it to age 40, that's the next, next color up, you were expected to live to 68, so another 20 28 years. Or, and the reason we look at age 40 is because if you think about our average employee, right, they're probably going to be in their 40s, let's say 40. And those are the people that we're funding pension benefits for. So if we were having a pension plan in 1900, we would have been um, expecting people to live to 68. We would have been funding maybe expecting to pay for our average 40-year-old three years of pension benefits. Okay, the top line represents life expectancy if you made it to 65. So if you made it to 65 in the year 1900, you were expected to live to age 77. So actually, if you actually made it from 40 to 65, then you were expected to live another 12 years. So you're going to have 12 years of retirement. I'm going to move all the way. You can see the trail. I'll speak to a few trends in a second. But I'll move all the way to the right side of the, of the, cur of the chart. So where were we by the year 2000, by the turn of this century? We've seen a massive improvement of life expectancy at birth. And while that's great for the general population, it doesn't really matter for pension plan sponsors, right? We're not funding pension plans from birth. We solved a lot of health issues. We have better um, sanitation systems. Um, people don't die of um, diseases because we have anti um, bacterial medicine, um, we're simply healthier and people live longer. They make it, most, you know, everybody, almost everybody makes it through childhood. Um, and if you look at actually mortality rights, most of us make it well into our 40s before incidents of death start getting at all profound. So making it to 40, um, you can see the difference between making it to 40, um, the life expectancy at birth and the life expectancy at age 40 has become really tight. Right? We've eliminated most causes of death between zero and 40. But uh, life expectancy has increased to age um, 77. Life expectancy at 40 is age 78. Not, not much of a difference at all. But we've moved from 68 to 78. We've had a 10-year improvement in life expectancy at age 40, sort of the life expectancy of our pension plan participants. We're expecting now to have 13 years of retirement benefits that we're going to be funding for a 40-year-old, whereas if we had a pension plan back in 1900, it was, a, it was just a handful of years. Life is spent in 65 is now up to 82. That's increased five years over the century. And what's interesting about that top line is that line is pretty darn straight. That's an even slope. You don't, you'll see some spikes and some movements in the lines below, but that line's pretty smooth, and it's almost decade after decade. We get about a half a year of life of, of mortality improvement, of longevity improvement as time goes on. And what's important to that thinking forward is we, that implies that that kind of improvement will continue to occur. And all we have to do is look at the ads on TV, right? They're all, they're all aimed at drugs and procedures that improve the life and quality of life of our older, older Americans. Okay. 
But we don't deal with ge the general population. We deal with uh, employees and participants that have access to pension plans, that have jobs, that are at the higher end for, uh, of the socioeconomic pool. And so what, is, and what that means is that the tables that we use for valuing defined benefit plans actually reflect even longer uh, mortality than or long, longer longevity than the general population. So when I first started working, we used a table uh, called the 71 Group Annuity Mortality Table. We were expecting life improvement to be 17.3. Shortly after I started working, there was a new table issue, the 1983 Group Annuity Mortality Table. That increased co uh, longevity by 1.7 years. Those of us around long enough remember delivering results to our clients and telling them all of a sudden, out of nowhere, our costs were 5, 6, 7 percent higher. In uh, 2000, there was a new table that came out. Actually, it came out after 2000. It was based on 2000 information. And it sort of changed methodologies. And the, sort of the net net of those two things was that um, life expectancy increased all the way to 20 and a half years. So we added another year and a half of, of uh, longevity. So, um, you know, another oh, you know, 7 and a half percent longer living. So maybe another 3, 4 percent in terms of um, liability. And then last year we got the good news that we're all living longer, which is good for all of us. An extra 2.2 years on average of life expectancy with these new mortalities. And, but the bad news is it was a you know, 7 or 8 percent um, hit to our bottom line from a balance sheet standpoint. So good news we're living longer. Bad news is it costs more money to provide retirement. Okay. When we put all these pieces together, we can sort of see the trends of what's happened to the funded status of plans. So um, what the group, bar, the chart at the top represents, the blue lines represent periods where um, a, a Milliman study of, a, of 100, uh, I think it's the Fortune 100 pension plans, what their funded status was. So blue lines means they were actually uh, in surplus. The red lines represent periods when they were below. Um, so we see that, you know, leap before the crash in 2000 and 9-11, um, pension plans were actually in a surplus position. Uh, the markets crashed. Interest rates continued to climb. And we went through a long period, fairly long period, six, seven years, where pension plans um, were working their way out through contributions and equity run-ups to where in 2007 we were back in the blue. And I remember a lot of pension plan sponsors in 2007, 2000. Uh, in 2007 saying, you know, sort of wiping their brow and saying, we're ready, it's time to move, um, we really should think about what we're going to do with our plan next. And the ones that were frozen um, started thinking about uh, termination. But many of them were not in a position from an asset standpoint. They're, they were still invested in equities. They weren't hedged on their, life, on their bonds. And the markets turned, and they turned hard. We all remember uh, 2008 and the, equity and the market crash. And here we are seven years later, and we're still deeply in the red. Um, the chart below, the Towers Watson chart below, shows sort of that period of time. Um, and we're inching our way out, and things are a little better than they were, but it's been a tough slog. And the main reason is from those earlier charts, right? Interest rates have declined. It's made it harder to make progress. So we've looked at sort of economic forces, demographic forces, and then we have our friends in the government. And they have, they have um, been playing games, uh, in, in excuse the, the context, but it's true. They've been playing games with defined benefit plans in order to raise revenue. The last two highway bills um, had pension legislation in there that was simply put in to drive revenue for the government, not to make pension plans better. And the, the, rec and the bill that was signed yesterday by the president did more of the same. And so what the, what the government has done is twofold. They have increased PBGC premiums um, because that, the increase in premiums is counted towards, is the positive towards the budget. And so back in 2010, we were paying $35 a head for each per participant we were covering. Not bad, expensive, but not bad. Um, I, you know, there are people who remember when it was like 4 or $5 a million years ago, but it's 30, it was $35. And if you were running an underfunded pension plan, if you had decided that there was a better way to deploy your assets uh, as a, from a corporate standpoint for running your business than putting in the pension plan, you're going to keep the pension plan well-funded, but not super well-funded, you know, maybe short, maybe 80%. That 20% shortfall, um, let's say just for 
make the math easy, was a million, let's say that 20% shortfall was a million dollars, then you were going to make a $90,000 premium uh, payment to the PBGC for the, for the that program. That has increased significantly. I'm sure a number of you were in shock to see your PBGC premium calculations this year and how much you had to send. The per, ca per head cost has gone up to $57 this year. We're at 2.4% uh, cost. And that is simply going to, that's going to, next year it's going to even be worse, going up to 2.9. The pension legislation, and that was scheduled and then be indexed um, by inflation to 2.9. The new bill is going to take that 2.9 and in 2007, instead of 3, it's going to be 3.1. It'll then go to 3.4. It goes to 3.8 the year after that. And then it's indexed after that for inflation. We are going to be paying 4% of the unfunded liability. So again, going back to my million dollars, instead of $90,000, um, let me do the math right, you're, you're going to be spending four, I'm sorry, it's $9,000. You're going to be spending $40,000 for the privilege of running um, an underfunded pension plan. If you think about a cost of capital, if your liabilities are being valued at 4% and you're paying 4% to the, to the PBGC and you've got a risk premium because of debt, right, debt has inherent risk, your cost of capital for running an un unfunded pension plan is something on the order of 9%. In other words, if you can borrow for 9% or you can't invest and lose cash um, in company projects that were expected to earn at more than 9%, then you're better off funding the pension plan than paying the PBGC and running the debt. Okay. The last line I want to spend two seconds on, too, which is this variable rate premium cap. I'll tell you, it's something I never thought about until this last two years, because none of my clients were hitting this variable rate cap. And the way the variable rate cap works is if the one point, let's say this 2015, if 2.4% of your shortfall um, plus $57 times your per head, if that turns into a per head of less than, I'm sorry, 2.4%, let me say it right, if 2.4% of your variable, of your unfunded is divided by the number of people is less than $418 per person, then you pay $418 per person. I never had clients hitting that. I had a number of clients hit that this year. So for clients hitting the variable rate cap premium, they were paying $400 and $75, if I did the math right, per head for uh, their variable, for their PBGC premium. And I'm going to get back to why that's an important concept. And that's going to ri rise up to $535. So the cost of PBGC costs have gone up. The other thing the government's done, not addressed directly in this, on this slide, is they have delayed when pension plan sponsors need to make their, their required contributions. So right now, uh, the liability rates are, uh, that we use for funding purposes, the cash that you need to put in the plan is based on a 25-year average of interest rates. And we saw that line earlier, right, of, of interest rates declining over the last 25 years. So when we take a 25-year average, we end up with a rate much higher than the true rate that exists now. So, you know, poorly funded plans are actually being discouraged or not being encouraged, let's put it that way, to put in, make contributions, but at the same time, they are being forced to make large PBGC premiums, sort of a bad bet. Um, the other thing that we know, know now that's going to come down the line is that in 2017, these, the new mortality tables that I spent a few minutes talking about a little bit ago are going to be incorporated in 2017, which means in 2016, when we value our pension plans for PBGC purposes, when we value our pension plans for funding purposes, and when we calculate lump sums for distribution purposes, we're still using those old mortality tables that are, reflect shorter longevity and lower cost than we are carrying on our books. All right, Michael, want to talk about how all that works together in, in managing a pension plan? Absolutely. Thanks, Charlie. So um, to understand how these things uh, that Charlie has discussed, how they, how they funnel in and, and impact the pension plan, uh, it's important to understand what drives a pension plan's funded status, right? So if the funded status is impacted by two things, liability drivers and asset drivers. And it's the balance between these drivers that really impacts those contribution requirements, your balance sheet liability, any P&L impacts that you have. So if we look at what those drivers are, um, the first one is probably the, the biggest risk that pension plan, that, that, that affects pension plan funded status, and that's interest rates. 
having a mismatch on, um, on interest rates on the liability side and the asset side uh, can cause a large amount of volatility in a plan's funded status. But because interest rates are on both sides of the equation, it's also our best opportunity to balance that, that risk. Going down to the next tier, we've got on the liability side demographic experience. So as Charlie explained, people are living longer. That drives liabilities up. On the asset side, we have asset performance. And when we talk about asset performance, it's more than just looking to see how your plan is, um, what the returns are compared to an investment benchmark. It's more how are your assets performing relative to your liabilities. And finally, the, the third rung we have on the liability side, what we call shrink the ball opportunities. These are opportunities that plan sponsors have to reduce the size of their liability. And examples of that are lump sum cash out windows and annuity purchases, which we'll talk more about a little bit later on in this webinar. And then on the asset side, there's contributions. So those last, that last rung, those are items that the plan sponsor can directly control. So how do we manage those risks going forward, and, and why is 2016 such an, an important year for pension plan sponsors? As we've all seen, and as Charlie illustrated in some of the background slides, you know, there's volatility out there in the equity markets. And with the uncertainty in the global economy, with quantitative easing in Europe and Asia, and how all of that um, compounds and affects us here in the U.S., we expect that there will be continued volatility in the equity markets. And then, as Charlie pointed out, interest rates are continually bouncing around as well. Things that we do know for sure that Charlie alluded to is that the IRS intends to incorporate those new mortality tables for uh, minimum funding and lump sum calculation purposes in 2017. Uh, that's going to make lump sums more expensive, and it's going to drive contribution requirements up. Annuity markets continue to be hot. We've seen an unprecedented activity giving rise to competitive pricing and a new influx of players in the insurance market, of insurers that are willing to take on those pension plan payments and, and, and allow plan sponsors to offload that to them. And then additional legislative changes. I mean, as Charlie mentioned, it seems like every time Congress passes a bill that deals with the budget or funding the, uh, the Highway and Transportation Fund, there's always some provision in there that, that negatively impacts pension plan sponsors. So putting the right strategy in place today can really help you as a plan sponsor save costs, continually improve your funded status, and most importantly, reduce and manage the risk that the pension plan uh, bears to your organization. So let's talk about ways that we can do that. And we'll start off first by talking about investment management, investment risk management strategies. So going back to our, our, um, our balancing um, between liability and asset drivers, we talked about how interest rates are the single biggest risk that can contribute to funded status volatility. Likewise, they're also the best opportunity to balance uh, both sides of this funded status equation since they do appear on both sides. So how does that work? It's, to understand that, it's important to understand how liabilities are calculated. So on this chart, I want to first focus on the dark gray line. Um, when, you, when your actuary collects your data, sets assumptions, and runs their valuation, their actuarial model, what it's doing is producing expected benefit payments that will be paid from your plan from today until you make that last payment to that last surviving participant clear out 70, 80 years from now. How you get the liability is you take that stream of expected benefit payments and you discount it back to today using, re, using yields on high quality corporate bond rates um, as represented by, by the red line on this chart. So for example, if we look at, if we look at 20 years out, um, our actuarial model expects $2.6 million in benefit payments. The yield at that, um, that maturity is about 4.5%. We would discount that $2.6 million back to today using 4.5%. So in order to construct an asset portfolio that matches and will behave similarly to how the liabilities will change as that, as that yield curve changes, we need to go out and buy a series of bonds. And as an example, we could go out and buy, um, if we look two years out from now, we could buy a bond today 
that has a yield of about one and a quarter that would pay out $1.8 million in two years. That would help immunize us from interest rate risk um, for that two-year payment. We could do the same thing and go out and buy a bond that has a maturity of about 10 years uh, that would pay out $2.7 million, has a yield right now of, of about 4.6%. What this does, if we go out and construct this portfolio to have these bond payments mimic our expected benefit payments from our pension plan, what we're going to find is that as interest rates change, our assets and liabilities are going to move together. So the point of all of this is that you can see in order to immunize a, a pension plan from interest rate risk, we have to have a customized bond portfolio. So let's look at why a customized bond portfolio is necessary. In this chart, what we've done is we've taken, we've taken three common fixed income indices and we've, we've plotted them against some sample pension liabilities. Sample pension liabilities are, are those purple bars, and what you can see is that there's a steady stream of payments in the first 10 years, but the bulk of payments happen 10 years out, 10 years out or more. When we look at a Barclays Long Credit or a Barclays Long Gov Credit fixed income indice, there's very little uh, fixed income exposure in those early maturities, in the maturities less than 10 years, and the bulk of it comes in maturities 10 plus years out. If we look at Barclays aggregate, which is, this is kind of your typical common core fixed income, um, what you see is the opposite. There's a lot of fixed income bonds with maturities in the first 10 years, but very little thereafter. So the point of this is that if you're simply invested in core fixed income, you're going to be out of balance. When we think about that, that scale between liability drivers and asset drivers, core fixed income or investing simply in, in a fixed income indice is not going to get you the balance that you need to, to appropriately manage that interest rate risk. So let's, let's see what that looks like in practice. What we did is we took a typical plan, and for simplicity's sake, we started it at 100 percent funded in 2015, and we ran 1,000 different five-year economic scenarios based on an asset allocation, very common that you'd see with a traditional pension plan, 65% in equities, 35% in core fixed income. And then we measured the projected funded status and summarized those results and grouped them by percentiles, which is what this chart is showing. So a couple of things that I want to point out here. First, our median kind of expected outcome um, from these scenarios has us at a, at a funded status of 110% at the end of our five-year projection period. Now that said, we also have a 5% chance that our funded status could have deteriorated to the point of being only 60% funded. On the flip side, we could find ourselves in a position where we're over 170% funded. So how we manage this range of potential outcomes is what we're trying to achieve by having a customized fixed income or liability-driven investment strategy. And we'll show you what that looks like. So instead of a traditional asset allocation, if we look at one that is now 70% liability and now in, invested in liability-driven in, um, assets, a customized bond portfolio, what we've done we still maintain our expected return, our 50th percentile um, outcome at about where it was with our, our traditional allocation, but we've shrunk the range of potential outcomes. And in fact, on the downside, we've gone from being almost 60% up to having a 5% event that's at 80%. Now, that's meaningful when you talk about the potential increase in contributions and the potential business hardships that could come from that if you find yourself down there in that in a 1 in 20 event um, and being that poorly funded. Now, we know that, that most of you on this call are probably not 100% funded right now, and that uh, if, if you were, you, you probably wouldn't have a lot of use for some of the stuff we're talking about. We also realize that, um, that some of you are going to maintain frozen plans. And so what we've done is we, we wanted to see what that picture looks like, right? So if we start instead of at 100% funded, what if we look at, 
at a starting point of 90% funded. And do that same analysis. And you see we've, we've drawn this red line, and that red line's at 105%, and we've done that intentionally. If you've got a frozen plan and you're working towards plan termination, that 105% is kind of the bogey you're looking for. That's the, if you can hit a funded status between 100 and 105, you're in that sweet spot of being able to have sufficient assets to, to fully terminate your plan. The problem is, is what happens if you get to the end of the day and you're ready to terminate your plan and you're over 105% funded? Well, unfortunately, once everything is paid out, and you've got assets that are going to be coming back to you as a, to, to the plan sponsor, you're going to get hit with a couple of taxes. The first one is a 50% excise tax that, that is basically penalizing you for having an overfunded plan at the point of, termi at the point of termination. And then you're going to get hit with your, your corporate tax rate on that. So it says, it, to put it in numerical terms, um, if at the end of the day you're left with a surplus of $100, what's actually going to come back to you as the plan sponsor when it's all said and done is probably more like 30 now, on the downside, if you, get to the, uh, if you get to termination and you find yourself in an underfunded position, you're going to have to shore up whatever that difference is. So if you're $100 underfunded, you're going to have to contribute that extra $100. What this goes to show is that there is an asymmetric risk profile with, with pension plans in that you own all the downside risk and there's very limited upside potential to ma maintaining an overfunded plan, which is why it becomes critically important then to manage that downside risk. So moving on. And Michael? Yeah. Just to, just to be obnoxious and correct what you said, but it's, it's just as important for a plan that's 100% funded to do the stuff we're talking about because they're already there. To get going backwards, is, there's, there's a lot of pain and getting a lot of excess return has only limited value. If the plan's open, maybe it funds future normal costs, but um, if it's frozen, you're 100%. There's nothing to be gained from upside, and there's a lot to be lost from downside. So, you know, mitigating your risk is really important on the interest rate side. Yeah, no, that's a very good point. So moving on to a, another um, asset driver um, that we need to, to manage when we're managing our pension risk is that of asset performance. So many plan sponsors don't have the luxury of unlimited amounts of cash to be able to, to throw into their pension plan to reduce underfunded liabilities. So they look to the plan's assets to make up some of that difference through returns. And in order to get those returns, sponsors will invest in, in risky assets, common commonly equity, equity assets. So what we did, we wanted to illustrate this point. Um, we, we took a typical pension plan asset allocation that's 60% equity, 40% core fixed income, and we ran a simulation. We ran the simulation 4,500 times, and we looked at what is the one-year return on that portfolio with that asset allocation. And that's what we've, we've graphed here, these gold bars um, represent the distribution of the various returns that came out of our model. Uh, so for example, when we look at uh, this bar right here that's centered around 4%, about 350 of our simulated returns of the 4,500 produced a return that was right about 4%. Um, so you can see there's, a, there's quite a bit of variability in the returns that, that come out of this kind of traditional pension plan asset allocation. And from there, we've carved this up into four pieces. And the four pieces that we've, we've put this in is really, if you're, if you're a pension plan sponsor that's trying to close the gap through asset returns, what you're really seeking for is something in that four to you know, eight or nine percent range that's going to produce asset returns, it's going to help your assets grow faster than your liabilities. And if you can get that on a consistent basis, that's what that's a good thing. That's what you would want. What we've got in the yellow is, you know, we can live with that. It's not ideal. You know, liabilities are probably growing faster than assets, but at least we're not losing a lot of ground. Now, over to the left here, this is where things get very painful for plan sponsors. When we start dealing with negative returns, and not just negative returns, but severe negative returns, uh, that causes a lot of problems. 
Um, on the flip side, though, we've got these returns where you know something like a, a 2013, where we where we saw returns in the 20% plus range in the equity markets, and from a pension plan sponsor viewpoint, while those are nice, to achieve those on a consistent basis is probably not practical. Um, but, it's not know, the goal, you know, right? That's right. So the question is, is what can we do to mitigate this risk, right? What can we do to avoid that very painful return scenarios? And the answer to that is something that we call structured equity. Structured equity is all about shaping your equity returns. It's, it's giving you what you're okay getting, which is the, the part from, say, 0% to 9%, and buying protection for some or all of the downside risk and purchasing that um, by selling off some or all of your upside potential. Out there in the financial markets, there are people that are willing to make those trades that will allow you to, they'll, they'll take that, um, that risk that, um, uh, of the downside in exchange for the potential of, of getting those excess returns. And the nice thing about structured equity is that it's fully customizable based on a plan sponsor's needs and their outlook on the market. So um, a plan sponsor could buy downside protection up to a certain level and then participate in, in the downside thereafter. They could actually leverage up their uh, exposure on the upside to where they're, they're outperforming what the markets are doing. They can choose at what level they want to sell off some of their upside participation. So really structured equity, it, it's not an off-the-shelf product. Very much like liability-driven investing um, should be based on a customized portfolio. Structured equity should also be customized based on what market conditions are at. As the plan sponsor, what are your views on what the markets will be doing in the next, say, one to three years? And what you need from a return perspective from your pension plan. All of those viewpoints funneled down into what that structured equity shape uh, will eventually look like. To give you a couple of examples, I um, wanted to throw out three, uh, three different time periods and in, in how a, a plan sponsor may have approached this. Um, so, for example, with 2007, markets were still favorable, still bullish, but uh, um, many companies started to be a little bit more cautiously optimistic, shall we say, about what the future had in store. A plan sponsor in that scenario would probably want to have some downside protection. The chart down below 2007, the dotted line represents um, basically the, the equity returns in the market. So in the upper right-hand quadrant, if markets are up, your pension return, your equity return part of your portfolio would be up in your plan. In the bottom left quadrant, it's the reverse. Markets are down and therefore your equity return in your, in your pension plan is down. What structured equity does is say, is, is would come in to say, we don't want to participate in any of that downside um, um, problems and we'll buy that protection to, so that if the markets go negative, we're still at 0% and we'll purchase that by selling off some of our upside potential. And so they've effectively shaped what their return profile is going to look like. Move ahead to 2008 when the markets were volatile. Um, the client was cautiously bullish. They felt like a recovery was, was, you know, nigh at hand. What they wanted at that point was stable returns in a volatile market environment. And so, again, they could shape their equity structure um, to, to generate those type of outcomes. 2009, very similar thing. They were very bullish at that point, felt like a recovery was, was on its way. They wanted to leverage the upside potential so that they would outperform the market, but they still wanted to have some downside protection, maybe not as extensively as they did in 2009. Really, the, the point of all of this is that with structured ep equity, you can shape your return profile to be based on what your biases are as a plan sponsor. And with that, Charlie, I'll flip it back to you to talk about liability risk transfer strategies. Thanks, Michael. 
So we talked about the uh, the balancing equation here, and it's easier to balance if you don't have a fat guy like me on the end of the uh, seesaw, right? So one of the ways of um, of dealing with the heavy guy is to have the heavy guy lose some weight. So we can shrink the ball. We can actually reduce the amount of liabilities um, in our plan by uh, settling um, tactically some of the liabilities in the plan. So we'll talk about those two things. If I had to guess, um, many of the plan sponsors on this call have done a lump sum window. But Michael and I have spoken at the Mid-Size Pension Conference uh, three times this year when we asked for a raise of hands. Um, we get probably most of the people, but not, you know, but only maybe it's 55, 60 percent. Many of the plan sponsors in the room still haven't um, run a lump sum window. And what a lump sum window does is it goes out to the typically the terminated vested participants. You're allowed to go out to them and say, hey, yeah, you've got a benefit of $100 a month, maybe age 65, you're 40 now. How about we give you a lump sum of, you know, $8,000, I'm making up the numbers, um, $8,000 instead. And typically, and that $8,000 is calculated by rules that are promulgated by the IRS. They dictate the interest rate, they just dictate the mortality table. And because the IRS hasn't adopted the new mortality tables yet, those lump sums are going to be less than the amount of liability on the uh, the accounting liability that's being put on the books. In 2017, the new tables are going to be incorporated. We don't know exactly how the IRS is going to adopt the table, so whether it will go all the way to the same as what we're doing for um, balance sheet purposes, but we know those lump sums are going to go out. So 2016, it tactically is a good year to go out and offer lump sums to clients. The other thing that's happened is we have had, as we saw earlier, a little bit of a run-up in interest rates this year. So rates are higher now than they were a year ago. And therefore, lump sum should be lower next year than they would have been in 2015. So if you did a project in 13 or 14, uh, 2016 looks like another good year to do it. By the way, also, if you have a lump sum provision in your plan, so the term vested could have gotten one when they left, there's no harm in going back out and reminding the term vested that they're entitled to a lump sum um, to take a lump sum. So it's something worth thinking about doing. Okay. I wanted to spend a little more time on annuity purchases because I think this is, this is a little bit more subtle um, and something that folks are really doing. We've talked about the cost of plan termination and, and when we were talking about LDI, how you really wanted to get to up to about 105% of your accounting liability in order to have sufficient assets to terminate the plan. And that's simply because the insurance companies, they have to administer the plans. It costs money to administer the plan. And they need to make some profit, right? So they're not going to take the plans for your accounting liabilities. They're going to take it at some level above the accounting liabilities. So the rule of thumb, 105% seems to be about the right number. All right. So if we think about the 5% as an administrative load, and if we determine that the administrative cost of maintaining some group of our participants is more than 5%, that it makes sense to hand it to the insurance company instead of us administering it ourselves. And that's the magic of looking at annuity purchases um, before you actually move to plan termination. And the other reality is if you're going to, if, you're, if your intent, and I'm focusing on frozen plans here, if, you're, if your intent is to eventually terminate the plan, then eventually you're going to have to buy annuities. So if you can eliminate expenses now instead of expenses later, then you're going to simply save those expenses that you eliminate now um, rather than paying them in the interim until you ultimately buy the annuities. Okay. So two things I want to think about. I talked earlier about pension plans that um, are you know, poorly funded, relatively poorly funded, and they're subject to the variable cap. And I would say that's maybe a third of plan sponsors out there now are going to be subject to the cap. And if you're a plan sponsor that can only, for business reasons, put in the minimum funding, you're likely to be subject to that variable cap for the next five, six, seven years. And that cap is going to be, let's say, average over that period of time, over $600 per head. <coughs> well, if, you know, 5%, if you've got participants who have benefits of less than $10,000 a year in annual payments, and by the way, that's going to be the vast majority of, of benefits for, for most retirement retirees and pay status for the, for the average plan, then 5% of $10,000 is $500. So for anybody who's got a benefit of under $10,000, it is worth looking at buying annuities for those people so that you don't have to pay PBGC premiums. 
Okay. You might want to go lower because there's an opportunity cost on, you know, ten thousand um, dollar participant might have a present value of eighty thousand dollars, and you may decide that you'd rather chase the investment returns that you can you can earn on those eighty thousand dollars and hope you outstrip the cost. But as I suggested earlier, you better be chasing investment returns of over eight percent, um, or else you're really not breaking even. Let's say you're not subject to the variable premium. Well, you know, over the next five, six, seven years. Your premium cost, your per head premium cost, is going to be something on the order of average seventy, eighty dollars, right? Let's call it eighty. Uh, you know, you've got to send funding notice to folks. Your trustee, uh, your whoever's cutting the checks, has got to send ten ninety nines. Um, they got to pay, send a check, or leave a wire, or whatever. The cost of that has to be at least twenty bucks a head a year. So call it a hundred dollars a head. You're just the administrative cost of keeping a retiree around as $100 a head. Well, if I divide that by 0.5%, most of you will get this, multiply that by 20, anybody I've got in my plan that has a benefit of under $2,000 a year, now I'm into relatively small benefits, $2,000 a year, um, you're better off actually buying an annuity for those people than you are um, keeping them for yourself. It's a pain in the neck to keep track of those people, right? So. And you will, again, be surprised looking in your retiree data. If you've had a plan for 30, 40, 50 years, you're going to find a lot of retirees with benefits under $2,000, and it's simply worth going out and annuitizing those folks. You're going to have to do it eventually anyways. Okay. Last year, as we've mentioned a few times, the annuity market um, was the largest it's been. It's been, uh, I think, about 15 years, 20 years, um, back when interest rates were higher that the annuity market has been that high. And it's really been the realization that plan sponsors have come to that, you know, shoot, I might as well, you know, I'll go back to my third, a third point that I haven't really spent too much time on, which is if you can, I, I mentioned earlier, if you've got the assets, if for whatever reason you've been managing this pension plan and you don't mind having an unfunded pension plan because you've got other places to deploy your corporate assets, but if you can borrow at something less than 8% or you've got cash that's uh, available, there's a real reason for funding these plans up and terminating. And that's why we've seen a big wave to um, the annuity markets this year. The, the, the providers are all really busy. A number of the providers have closed their doors. You cannot go out and buy an annuity um, as a Janu for a January 1 distribution date. Um, they're simply out of capacity. Okay. So sort of summarizing, we've got these points as I've, we've talked along the way, but, but why would you implement one of, the, uh, one of these risks? Strategies, whether it's by, you know offering lump sums to your terminated terminated vested participants, or buying annuities for some portion of your retirees, well, the reality is there is cost, right? There's administrative costs, there's internal administrative costs, and sending out SPDs every five years, or you make a little plan change and you got to send a summary material modification, and you have to send annual funding notices every year. You have to keep track of of where people live, the terminated vested, and you have to update the data every year and send it to your actuary. Um, we've we've harped on, and I, you know, my clients are getting sick of me talking about PBGC premiums, and I've been talking about it for a couple of years now, and I'm going to continue talking about it. It is a big cost, and it's going to get bigger, and folks really need to wrap their head around it. So, um, saving those costs is going to be um, quite valuable. Um, you know, the, the the smaller, if you pay out some lump sums and you buy some annuities, and you take a fifty million dollar plan and turn it into forty five million dollar plan. You've just eliminated 10% of the volatility of the plan. That's a good. That's a good thing. Okay. One of the things you got to think about, and sort of switch gears back a little bit on lump sum windows, is there are paternalistic issues, right? You know, if you offer these windows, what can you expect people to do with the money? Um, you do need to be aware of what the accounting impact is. If you're if you're under international accounting standards, actually, you can actually generate pension income, and then ongoing, you're going to have a lower pension expense. Um, for American companies or companies that are owned by American companies, um, and you're following FAS, there could be a settlement charge, so you could actually generate a one-time P&L hit, whereas, but the next year um, you would have lower pension expense. So it's sort of a pay, pay me now versus pay me later type thing. Okay. Um, we did a study last year aggregating data from uh, our friends at another um, pension consulting firm, and a bunch of studies we had done, a bunch of not studies, a bunch of um, projects we had done for lump sums, and sort of because we were concerned or thinking about, um, 
you know, what the utilization of lump sums were. How did people behave? And what we found was, in general, over, I think there were about 30 of these lump sum windows between the two, the two uh, companies, uh, around the 30, uh, 30 uh, plan sponsors, you know, it didn't matter too, too much by the size of the lump sum on people's behavior. Somewhere between 50 and 60 percent of participants elected a lump sum in lieu of, you know, a benefit to be paid later. Um, and from an individual sponsor to individual sponsor, we had sponsors um, have participation rate, participation rate, excuse me, participation rates as high as 80 percent, and we had some that were as low as 40 percent. It sort of depended on, you know, how it was communicated, the nature of the group, and whatnot. What, the, what this chart also illustrates is what people did with their lump sum distribution. So the first bar looks at folks who were between, uh, who had lump sums of under $10,000. 40% of the people were offered lump sums in that group, took a lump sum, and took the cash. They took the money and ran. 20% uh, of the purple bar or whatever that color is on top um, actually did the right thing. Um, at least outside looking in, the right thing, and rolled it over in lump sum. And what you see is a clear pattern is as the lump sum, lump sum amounts got larger and larger, a greater percentage of folks actually did the right thing and took those monies, these retirement monies, these monies that were set aside to fund future retirement, and rolled it into IRA. So that gives you a little bit idea of what to think about um, as you look at uh, lump sum windows. Michael, want to walk them through a couple case studies? For about a few yeah, minutes. Uh, yep. we'll, uh, we'll go through these quickly and just hit on the high points. So, um, you know, one case study looking at a client um, that did a lump sum window last year. Of their pension plan population, about 40% of all participants were terminated vested. And they went out and offered this group a one-time opportunity to either start their benefit as an annuity or to take it as a lump sum. And when all was said and done, about 60% of the participants that were, were given the offer um, elected to receive the lump sum distribution. Um, as Charlie talked a little bit about the arbitrage uh, that can happen with these lump sum windows, uh, for this particular sponsor, their funded status on their balance sheet in increased from 57% to 60%. Now, there was that additional settlement accounting charge uh, that they had to take in that in the year that they did the window, but their projected uh, pension expense going forward uh, is expected to decrease. Um, this plan was also subject to the variable rate premium cap, and so a reduction in headcount um, is an immediate savings in PBGC premiums for the uh, for the foreseeable future compared to what it would have been otherwise had those vested terminated participants remained in the plan. And just like with you know, this is a lump sum window is one of those shrink the ball opportunities. Um, doing this lump sum cash out window helped to reduce the ongoing magnitude of, of potential swings in funded status um, for this plan. Similarly, um, a, a case study related to an annuity purchase where about a third of the entire um, population were retirees. Um, when we looked a little bit closer at that group, 80% uh, of those had annual benefits that were $10,000 or less. Uh, the company here looked at, uh, they went out to the insurance market, got quotes for um, what it would cost to offload those, those monthly payments to an insurer and found that it was about a 4% premium above the accounting liability that they were holding on the books for those participants. Um, once they factored in the present value, and they just looked at this over a five-year time horizon, but the present value of PBGC premium savings, that resulted in about a 5% of PBO uh, of the accounting liability savings. So the net savings, when you factor in the, the annuity purchase premium with the administrative savings, was, was actually a net savings of 1%. Now, again, they will have... A, they have an additional settlement accounting charge, a, an additional pension expense amount, uh, that they'll have to run through their P&L, but um, everything else equal, their projected pension expenses is, is estimated to go down 5 to 10 percent per year. They also have that immediate uh, um, PBGC premium um, reduction due to the fact that they're, they've now lowered their headcount and they're, they're dealing with a smaller liability on an ongoing basis. So what do we want you to get out of all of this? We, we know we've talked about a lot of stuff, um, some of it at a fairly high level. 
Um, what we hope you take away from this webinar is that you need to go back and have those frank discussions about where you're at and where you want to be related to your pension plan. From there, work with your advisors, your investment consultants, your actuaries, um, and your management team um, and figure out what pension risk management strategies you're going to adopt and implement to get you from where you're at today to where you need to be. And then know that, that 2016 is a key year and there are opportunities you can take advantage of immediately um, that will help you on that road to managing your plan. And I think with that, we are, we are out of time for, for questions uh, for this portion, but uh, I believe we'll be able to get uh, any questions you've submitted and be able to respond to you um, within the next couple of days directly. Thank yes, you that's much. right, Michael. Thank you so much, Charlie and Michael, and thank you, audience, for joining us today. Be sure to check out our website for future webinars and uh, for our conferences for 2016. The schedule is up. As soon as we end today's meeting, please take a moment to complete the brief survey that will open on your screen. It's just five questions, and we'd love to hear from you. Again, thanks so much, and everyone have a great afternoon.